So hi everyone and welcome to the third episode of the Biome podcast of season two with Emma, Kate and Roby. And so this week we are going to talk about something very controversial. Um, what's new? We, we have a We've theme going We've never done that here. before. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we are going to talk about culling. Um, so just to say this from the get-go, we want to make this as balanced as possible. We're not pro colours trying to convince you all to go out and shoot animals. We just want you to present both sides of the argument so that you might be able to see that culling could serve as a conservation strategy in some cases. Um, so do you want to start, Kate, by maybe telling us a bit like what is culling? What do we mean when we're talking about that? Yeah, so culling is essentially the selective killing of members of an animal population in order to reduce the population size or eradicate the population. It can be selective on sort of different levels. So it can be at an individual level where you're culling a particular animal or particular animals um, where you've identified them as individuals and you're deliberately taking them out. It can be selective by sex. So you're only going to cull males or by age or by sex and age, so only males over a certain age. Um, Or it can be completely random, where you're just saying, we've got a population of this species and we need to take 20 out, and you just randomly cull 20. The three kind of main uses of culling that we're going to discuss in this podcast are for population control, so to reduce populations that have gotten too big for the carrying capacity of the area they are in, to remove invasive species from an ecosystem and the third is to prevent the spread of disease within um, a species or cross-contamination across species as well. So I'm going to start off with telling you a little bit about how culling might be used under a population control scenario Um, and this is kind of what's thought of as the most kind of prevalent usage of culling. It's in the media quite a lot, it's in conservation quite a lot. And it's important when we start talking about this to understand that culling is only necessary because of anthropogenic activity. Normally, if a population with no humans around in the environment, if a population got to a level where the environment couldn't sustain it, there would be natural population checks. So you might have a population collapse. You see a lot of populations such as lynx and snowshoe hares in Canada go through these cyclical phases of expansion and then contraction and expansion and contraction. But it is important to recognise that we're here, there's 7 billion of us on the planet, and we have an impact on natural ecosystems. And so a lot of the time populations can grow out of control. Maybe we've removed some of the natural population checks, such as predators from the environment, which leads to population expansion. Um, And that can have quite severe impacts on the ecosystem. We've talked about this a lot with red deer in Scotland. Um, But I'm actually going to talk to you a little bit about horses, just because I thought it might be a bit more interesting to get maybe an animal which is perhaps closer tied to humans. We love horses. We've domesticated them since ages ago in the Mesopotamia and the Eurasian steppe. Um, But there are, in fact, populations of feral horses. And these are called Mustangs in the American West and Brumbies in the Australian Outback, which I think are great. I love that. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, they're fantastic. I love that. (laughs) Um, And so I'm actually going to talk to you about Brumbies uh, today. So obviously they were brought there by Europeans. Horses aren't indigenous to Australia. Um, And they've been released into the outback or escaped. And now they're quite widespread in certain areas. Um, And they're quite a controversial animal. So a lot of people would regard them as a pest or a threat to native ecosystems. So this tends to be environmentalists and the government. But they're also valued as part of Australia's heritage, a bit like in the Wild West with all the horses and the cowboys and things going along. Um, And crucially, Brumbies in Australia have now reached a point where their population needs to be controlled. They have no known native predators. When humans reached Australia around 40,000 years ago, we wiped out all the big predators, the giant crocodiles and the monitor lizards and the marsupial lions and things. Um, And so now these animals have no natural population checks in the environment. That being said, the population growth is not actually as drastic as you might think. It's thought that around 20% die each year from drought and poisonous plants and parasites because we know that everything in Australia wants to kill everything else. (laughs) Um, And so maximum population growth rate is around 20 to 25% a year. But they do have 
quite severe environmental impacts. They overgraze certain areas, stimulating the expansion of dry desert regions. Um, and this obviously has knock-on effects on soil and vegetation and native animals. So are they, they are living in big groups then, these mustangs? Is it kind of like a, a herd sort of thing? Or is it more like individuals that are causing problems? So they tend to live in what's assumed is similar to the kind of native horse social structure where it's a herd mainly of females led by a large male and they'll fight for dominance um you wouldn't see huge herds in one space like wildebeest on the serengeti but you would see lots and lots of little herds all kind of congregating around water sources for example um so this raises the question of what to do about them so animal welfare groups such as rspca australia kind of accept culling um, but there are a lot of animal welfare groups such as Save the Brumbies that oppose lethal culling and instead favour relocation. Um, and a big conservation groups such as the Australian Conservation Foundation favour humane culling as a means of control uh, to kind of save local fauna and biodiversity. Um, and so you get large culls of these Brumbies, which is usually shooting by trained marksmen, either from the ground or from helicopters, which is kind of crazy but they're, they're big into helicopters in the australian outback just because the distances are so vast they must have so much training involved yeah, yeah. to not only yeah. own and fire a rifle but whilst in a helicopter that's yeah. mad the, the, i mean the, the kid in me is kind of like i want to do that i want to fire a heli- rifle at a helicopter and then i'm like actually i don't want to go out and kill anything um and what's quite interesting is that the new south wales department of primary in- industries actually considers shooting to be more humane than translocation which would involve lassoing the animals uh putting them into a big yard and then long distance transportation um and so around in around the year 2000 around 600 of these brumbies were shot in a place called guy river no guy forks river national park not quite sure why does, guy forks does that have Park. any links to the <laughs> i don't know um and, <laughs> <Argyle> <laughs> and uh and um yes that he that, that was a massive outcry and there was a big social media campaign to try and save some of these brumbies and some were trapped and removed um and so what i quite like about this example is it really makes clear that even when the, a population must be controlled due to human factors it's rarely as simple as cull or not to cull because you've also got to consider that these animals are considered a vestige of australia's colonial history um, a lot of Ab- Aboriginal people view them as a kind of a symbol of their historical dispossession um, and clearances off their ancestral land. So it, I don't know. It's quite. It's a nice example of how the human factors always interfere with with the cold hard ecology. So well, what do you guys think about this? That's really interesting. Um, I hadn't really considered that before. The kind of cultural implication of um oh, those horses i think that's a really key factor that when i think about culling i don't necessarily immediately jump to that i think Me more the kind of ecological impacts and the conservation concerns and then the ethical concerns around you know killing versus not killing um but i think that's a really key point and i can see why people would say would be more in favor of culling in that respect because of the the implicate the kind of ties to colonialism I also mm. think the the point about it being potentially more humane than translocation is really worth highlighting. I think that's really interesting because we would your kind of gut feeling is death is the worst that should, we should do everything we can to avoid it because that's how we treat our own species. Kind of we do everything we can to keep everyone alive um, with like modern medication and stuff like that, which is actually not a supernatural process in you know survival of the fittest and in nature. If you're weak, you die, and we humans are we're so against that idea. So I think it's it's interesting to think that sometimes actually it is potentially kinder than translocation. Yeah, I think absolutely. one thing too that's kind of an interesting point there is it just shows that this is so much a species by species case with with culling. So say with horses, translocation might be more stressful and um, kind of almost less humane in a way than culling. Whereas something like badgers to to cull them causes so much distress and movement whereas trapping them would be so much easier so it's kind of like i think we have to look at this species by species when we're when we're considering culling yeah definitely um another example we have of um population control the use of culling in population management is elephants in 
Africa and in Asia, but I'm going to speak primarily about culling and using Africa uh, for management of elephants. Kind of, I think we can all accept that elephants are a universally adored animal. Um, People love elephants. I love elephants. Um, And there are lots of reasons for that. I think they're so big and charismatic, but they are also ecosystem engineers. So they greatly modify the landscapes that they're in and they are a keystone species. They play a completely unique role in the ecosystem through herbivory and seed dispersal and habitat restoration. And having elephants around can really benefit a great number of species who rely on that role in the ecosystem. One of the things that elephants do a lot is they knock over trees to knock the leaves that they want to the ground and so that their young can get them and they have better access. And because they're so big, they can just knock these trees over. And that can create habitat on the ground for smaller animals to kind of live under the now collapsed logs or to use the logs to move along or to just utilise in different ways. And it also means that smaller animals can forage on the leaves. But it also... The flip side of that is that the animals that utilise the tree when the tree is upright miss out. So if you have too many elephants knocking over too many trees, you're benefiting some animals, but it's a problem for other animals that would utilise the tree in its kind of normal state. So elephants, this kind of disruptive, destructive role that elephants play in the ecosystem can be a problem if you have too many of them and they alter the habitat too much. And... I, I I guess that just to just to kind of raise the point that we touched on before, I guess that this is a too many elephants is a problem because they live in national parks where they can't naturally disperse out of. Is is that right? Like, yeah. If we definitely. if we weren't here, that yeah. Africa would be full of elephants and it'd be fine. But yeah. because now we've we've limited them to these national parks, we've created an artificial threshold. It seems for how many each park can sustain. Is that right? Yeah, the kind of concept of too many animals relates to the space that they're in. Mm. So it was it's too many for their home, um, their habitat that they're in, and that has obviously come about comes about more often when you're talking about enclosed spaces mm-hmm. like national parks or reserves that are fenced off, where naturally if the animals ate all the trees in that area, they would just go somewhere else. Mm. Um, but they can't do that. So this idea of carrying capacity relates to kind of specific areas and generally in modern times, that does mean areas that are literally fenced in. Another key point about elephants is that they have a high potential for conflict with humans. Um, Oh yeah. Their destructive (laughs) nature isn't, yeah. (laughs) This kind of destruction isn't limited to trees. They have destroy buildings and properties and crop raiding is also a really big problem in both Africa and Asia, where elephants come and eat people's crops. So obviously culling raises kind of ethical, social and economic problems, but so does the loss of biodiversity. And national parks aim to maintain biodiversity by preventing habitat destruction. So if elephant populations do get too destructive, there is a need to reduce them to allow other species to thrive. Due to habitat loss and degradation, many places cannot sustain the populations that they have. So in 2004, a paper was published that said Zimbabwe had 100,000 elephants in a habitat that could support half that number. Obviously, that stat is a little bit out of date, but basically that meant that in 2004, Zimbabwe's carrying capacity as a country was half 50,000 elephants instead of 100,000. And I think this raises quite an interesting discussion point because globally elephants are an endangered species but nationally in Zimbabwe they weren't and I think when we talk about endangered species we often firstly look at that species in isolation and then secondly look at the species as a whole instead of at the population level so when I say look at the species in isolation we might hear elephants are endangered so having a hundred thousand elephants is great But we're forgetting that those 100,000 elephants are exceeding Zimbabwe's carrying capacity and that might threaten the survival of other species. So we're kind of only looking at the elephants and not taking into account the context that they're in. So you've you've got to kind of think 100,000 elephants is great as long as they're in the right place. Yeah, Whereas 100,000 elephants where there's not enough room and there's not enough habitat is, is a recipe for disaster. Yeah, it's the same as kind of any statistic in isolation is pretty meaningless. Hearing there's 100,000 elephants in Zimbabwe 
okay like cool. that's, <laughs> but um, i feel in a way it's it's hard to to get your head around even as a conservationist it's like if it's an endangered species surely more numbers spread out between different places would make more sense in my head than than killing them but i understand that's not always possible you can't always um move yeah. them around and the the second issue when we fail to look at population level it means that we might miss the fact that some populations are doing really well um so we hear elephants are globally endangered but in zimbabwe they're, they're doing having a really great well time <laughs> in 2004 um and so <laughs> This the same thing happens with other animals. It happens with lions. There was a point where South Africa had too many lions, um, but globally lions were still an endangered species. And this focus on conservation status can sometimes blind us into focusing too much on keeping every individual animal alive and taking this kind of species-specific approach to conservation instead of doing what's right for the mm-hmm. ecosystem as a whole. So in the case of elephants... Culling is used to manage ecosystems threatened by the destruction of elephants and also to minimise human-elephant conflict. And human-elephant conflict is a big threat to elephants. Mm. So there's potential that culling could help minimise that threat so could benefit the elephants as a whole in the end. So, so the thinking is sacrificing individuals. So the, think, so the thinking is you would cull a certain number of elephants today to prevent human wildlife conflict tomorrow to prevent more elephant deaths further down the line yeah i think there's there's definitely potential for that um so elephant culling can be again it's it can be selective at the individual level so Mm -hmm. problem individuals that are typically causing the conflict could be culled or reducing the overall population size but the fact that culling can help minimize the conflict does mean that the elephants have a better chance to kind of coexist in mm. general so it's it's interesting i think maybe maybe one point to make as well like while we recognize that culling could serve as an ecosystem benefit as a whole um roby and i did a, a podcast recently on zoology ramblings about kind of human elephant coexistence and looking at some of the the alternatives to culling and there are some fantastic ones out there so check that one out we mentioned the elephants and bees project using bees beehives if you want more information but that's kind of an example of these really innovative ways that are trying to address human elephant conflict in in a in a very different way Mm, absolutely and so those are two kind of well uh, not they're quite far afield those examples of culling um and both of them you could probably make a case I don't know if you'd win this particular case, but you could definitely make a case for and against culling in, in, in both scenarios. You could probably, I think you could probably make a case for and against on an ecosystem level for culling and on a cultural level. Um, but just to give you an example of culling in Britain, so a lot closer to home, um, and one which is generally less, um, the science behind it is less contested, um, is the case of red deer in Scotland, which we've talked about quite a lot because we have a, a big interest in rewilding and ecosystem restoration and deer numbers are a big part of that. Um, so obviously, if you have this image of Scotland in your head, it's these lovely windswept, bleak, slightly bleak <laughs> forest, uh, not forest. I'm going to start the sentence again. So if you have this typical idea of Scotland in your head, it's you know a bit like Skyfall, these vast unforested glens, these open hills. Um, And it's largely highland clearances and sheep grazing, which were the original cause of this deforestation, because before this, Scotland was actually quite heavily forested. You had the Caledonian Forest, which was actually a temperate rainforest um, and loads of other very large forest patches. Um, But now it's obviously all been reduced to very little. Um, However, now the prime culprit of this is overgrazing by red deer. So red deer are a native species to both Britain as a whole and and Scotland as a region. but red deer density now is 100 times higher than it is in other parts of Europe. And there's an estimated population wow. of around 400,000 red deer. That's a lot of deer. That's a lot of deer. And there's a couple yeah. of reasons why there are so many. Uh, so we shot and killed all the wolves and the lynx which would and the bears, which would naturally control their numbers. They've got no predators. We also feed them during the winter uh, because they're an economically important species for deer shooting and deer stalking. Um and they've kind of got the whole of the Scottish Highlands to themselves to just roam and reproduce and eat. Um, and they have an incredibly detrimental effect on Scotland's biodiversity 
threatened habitats such as Scotland's rainforests, peat bog, montane scrub are under pressure, and with that comes a whole load of threatened species, stuff like capercaillie, um, a, a, a large a large grouse species, and also plant species, which we tend to forget when we talk about endangered species. But in Scotland, plants like juniper and aspirin and willow are really, 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 really threatened. Um, and so here, landowners do cull deer. And if you own land in Scotland and you have deer on it, it's your obligation to cull them and control them. Um, most Scottish wildlife and conservation organisations want a, a, a higher cull in order to protect the dwindling biodiversity. Because Scotland's really at the centre of this biodiversity crisis in Britain at the moment, which is with these so many deer. Um, and so, again, culling is an emotive issue. No one likes to see anything die and no one likes to see anything shot. Um, but in Scotland, at least the opinion and the scientific consensus is fairly concrete that a cull is necessary to control the burgeoning population of these of these red deer. So that's just an example of, well, those are three examples of how culling can be used um, in a kind of a population control framework. We haven't, uh, you'll probably notice, we haven't given our opinions definitively either way on any of those. We will come to our own opinions on culling at the end of this podcast when we've taken you through some of the other ways that you might use culling. So another way you might use culling is for the control of invasive species. Yeah, so a slightly potentially less controversial in the media anyway use of culling is in invasive species and so just a quick definition for people who aren't sure what we're talking about invasive species are species that have been introduced to an area where they were not previously found and they're causing harm to the native species or ecosystem so not all introduced species are invasive it's only those that cause harm to indigenous species or ecosystems and a typical characteristics of invasives is they are often opportunistic and generalist and basically they establish themselves very easily um, and tend to thrive in their new environment, which makes them harder to get rid of. And invasive species is one of the biggest threats to biodiversity worldwide. Culling is often deployed as a method to remove species to prevent them from breeding. And so we're going to go through some examples of that now. And just but just before we do, I think just to give a little example, so you, you're kind of aware of what we're talking about here. An invasive species would be something like mink, which Emma's going to talk to you about now, because they're introduced and have a harmful impact on the environment. Whereas an introduced but not invasive species would be something like the Reeves monkjack, little deer which came from Asia in the 19th and 20th centuries and is now spreading across the country, but there haven't been any... Um, recorded negative effects so that's the kind of difference we're talking about here yeah no and i think that's important to notice to to, well, to note that some species can be non-native but they don't necessarily have to be causing a load of damage so you, it shows that we need that really in-depth knowledge of an ecosystem and how it works to know if it'll have a positive or neg negative effect so i'm going to talk to you a little bit about um mink here in the UK. So this is something very close to home. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen any. If you have, have, let us know. In the... You have? Where have you oh, seen Oh, sorry, them? are you talking to the audience? <laughs> you, it could be you or the audience. <laughs> I've seen American mink in Canada, so I haven't seen them in the UK where they're introduced, but I have okay. seen them in their native environment. They were weird. They were like small, brown, fluffy sausages that just kind of <laughs> They were on these rocks by the lakeshore and they moved like little... It was weird. You almost couldn't see the legs. They were like sliding up and down the rocks. And I was there thinking, what on earth is this? And then I was like, oh my God, it's a mink. <laughs> wow. I, I love that description. Sorry, that was that just a mink story. <laughs> Small yeah. brown fluffy sausages. I think they we're going to go with that description. <laughs> Lovely. So yeah, on that point that you just made, Broby, is... So the mink that we have here in the UK are American mink. So they're an invasive species. They um, are this, these semi-aquatic mustelids that are native to North America. So they're not, not native to, to Europe at all. And they were brought in to Britain sort of in the 1930s um, for fur farms when that was a big, the fur industry was really, really taking off. And so what happened is they either escaped from these fur farms or they were released kind of without knowledge of the consequences that that would have. People like, oh, it's inhumane the way they're being kept in these fur farms and a lot of them were just set free. Um, but because 
they're not native, they have had catastrophic effects on the environment, um, including um, threatening Britain's most endangered mammal, which is the water vole. So mink have driven water voles from 90% of their former territory. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. And this is so water voles before they would have been able to jump into the water to escape predators or go into their burrows. But American mink, are they can swim. They're really, really strong swimmers. And they can follow them into their burrows. So they basically decimated water vole numbers in the UK, which is a big concern for sort of UK conservation as a whole, because to, for that to be our most endangered mammal that's being decimated, that that's quite serious. Mm. And just yeah. to give you a scale of how much... They've kind of exploded in numbers. There are now 100,000 mink in the UK. Many, from many Cornwall mink. Cornwall up to Scotland. So and I think that really shows that kind of opportunistic and mm. those kind of key characteristics of invasives that make them so problematic because the poor water voles didn't have a predator necessarily before that could get into their burrows. If they did, they would have designed their burrows differently. And so these poor water voles are completely defenceless against these minks because they shouldn't be there. <laughs> so they shouldn't have had to evolve to deal with them. And the mink obviously is now just going to completely wipe them out because they have no predator defense to minks because they were never expecting to come into contact with them. Yeah. And it's, inter that... it's interesting no, you say that about, you know, the generalist species and why this makes such a good invader. So, you know, Europe does have a native mink species, but it's much less carnivorous than the American mink. It spends less time in water. Water voles have evolved in concert with these mink. There's a predator-prey relationship there, and so they're much right. less effective hunters of mink. But these American ones completely turn the tables. Um, and yeah, they, they, they completely outclass European mink in terms of basically all the metrics by which a predator can succeed. Yeah, and I think it's just something to mention as well like you were saying kate is with an invasive species say something that they're predating upon if they're a predator species they won't have evolved any adaptations to cope with that like you mm. were saying so they're defenseless basically against these these invaders so i mean to link this back to culling kind of what's being done with mink as a way to control them is using these mink raft traps um so basically they're these floating rafts which which can have a trap in the middle and it's very selective so you check the traps individually if it's a mink it's shot humanely um the individual is killed but if anything that's trapped which isn't a mink it's just let go so so you're not killing anything that that isn't an american mink um but it's quite costly it's estimated that it would cost 10 million pounds for a 50-year eradication program wow um, so yeah also, I think that's something to consider with culling, the different purposes of it. This, mm. The purpose of this would be complete eradication, yeah. Um, which is obviously a lot harder to achieve, especially those final few individuals. Like You could eradicate probably most of them, but you're going to have some that are trap shy. You're going to have some which just are, are very, very difficult to catch. But that's probably, um, even even if you could never get rid of all of them, it would probably still be worth doing to re reduce the mink the invasive mink down to just a, a few tiny population centres because then in the rest of the country, water vole numbers can recover. Yeah. Yeah, no, and it, it has been successful, this sort of trapping and shooting specific ones has been very, very successful and mink numbers have greatly diminished um, or even been entirely removed from vast areas of Scotland. Um, and just to, just to, if you, maybe you weren't aware of this, we have had an eradication program like this before, which was successful. So this was the the Koipu. Is that how you say oh, it? Oh, yeah, the Koipu. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So that was in the 1970s and 80s. It was eradicated. If you haven't seen one, they look like they look like beavers. Do you know, kind of. I had a weird moment with a Koipu when uh, someone <laughs> sent me. That is, that is a brilliant <laughs> start to a sentence. No, someone Fire sent out of Okay, so you know, you know, you know, a couple of when it was snowing, part of the Thames froze over. Yeah. I saw yeah. this video on Instagram of a koipu coming out of the water on this icy frozen river, and I assumed it was the Thames, 
So I messaged the person who put the video up saying, Hi, I'm not sure if you're aware, would you mind getting in touch with your local wildlife trust because this is a really bad invasive species and it's thought they've all been driven to extinction, but if this is a survivor in the Thames, you really should let them know so they can get rid of it. And he replied saying, this was in France. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, well... <laughs> okay, that's fine. <laughs> You're all good oh then. Oh my goodness, that's brilliant. <laughs> I mean, they are also invasive in France, but I, I don't, I don't have any kind of jurisdiction, and they don't control them in France. They don't, they don't cull them in France. They just let them live. I was gonna say, if we have them back, I was like, <laughs> maybe it wasn't a successful eradication, because <laughs> yeah. as far as we know, it was. So I felt um, a bit of fool, but yeah, I was foiled by. I think it's good. You're trying to advocate for for yeah. recognising if you have an invasive species. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, just a final point to mention on the mink is that advances in technology have actually really, really helped advance the control of their numbers. So like I mentioned, we now have these mink graphs, um, which are effective, but now also what you have is the, what's called a trap closure alarm. So this means Ooh. that when a trap door closes, um, it sends an email or a text to, to the landowner who is in in who owns the, the raft and that means that this this cuts down the workload because then the farmer or landowner only has to go check the trap when they know something is actually in there and it also means that animals are le- likely to not be in the trap for more than 24 hours because it's this efficient text email system um and then another really cool one, which I didn't realize was possible, but so they're looking at molecular identification techniques where you could actually analyze bodies of water, so rivers or lakes, and that would be able to tell you whether mink were present in that water That's system. That's cool. I so want to the, do that. That I, I really amazing. like that. The idea that That's really cool. you could target the last few populations of mink by testing the water and being like, okay, they're here. We know whether to trap or not to trap. That, so, would, that would just be so yeah. useful for kind of wildlife filmmaking in general. Could you imagine if we were looking for otters as we were? We turn up, we dip a little stick in the water. Oh, yep, definitely otters. That would be so handy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I just think it's amazing what technology has allowed us allowed mm. us to achieve. Um, but that's definitely. just one example. There are so many um, examples of invasive species. Do you want to tell us about another marine one, Kate? Yeah, so another example where culling is widely being used to remove an invasive is uh, in the Caribbean, the Indo-Pacific lionfish, which Latin's name is um, Torois volitans and Torois miles. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, And they are incredibly invasive in Caribbean. So hang on. Yeah, love a Latin name. No, I was just going to say Indo-Pacific lionfish and it's in the Caribbean. That's a red flag, isn't it? Yes. So it's <laughs> it's incredibly invasive in Caribbean reef systems and an unchecked lionfish invasion can lead to irreversible changes to these reef systems, um, including reduction in forage fish, um, so foraging fish species because the lionfish predate on them. Um, they compete with predatory fish and then you can, there's a possibility for a trophic cascade here basically because mm. If the predatory fish decline through competition with the lionfish and the small foraging fish species decline because of being predated on by the lionfish, then the algae on the corals will increase because those small herbivorous fish are no longer eating the algae. And then the health of the corals will decline and therefore the whole ecosystem will be damaged because coral is literally the bedrock of these ecosystems and provides both food and shelter for hundreds of species. And as I think we all know, coral reefs are already under threat from a variety of different things, including overfishing, um, which is a primary threat and also compounds this trophic cascade because you're, it's another reason that these predatory and herbivorous fish populations are declining. Pollution and coastal development is also a big threat to reef systems, disease, hurricanes in this part of the world as well. And obviously coral bleaching through climate change is pretty famously mm. a growing problem yeah. around the world. So removing these lionfish can be really beneficial to the ecosystem as a whole, and it is a lot easier to kill the fish than to try and catch them alive, um, particularly before they get a chance to breed. Also, what um, would you do with them if you caught them all alive? Exactly. Um, you need a big you'd fish to, tank. Yeah, yeah, you'd have to, to keep them somewhere. Because it's um, just yeah. it's spear fishing, isn't it? So it dies yeah. straight away, and then they put them in these big tubes 
and yeah what? in my mind yeah. that's, that's relatively humane yeah like they spearfish it and then these they've got these cylindrical tubes where they stack them all which they then use to take them back oh, to oh sure. that's cool yeah. i think um, interesting. Yeah, <laughs> so your spearfishers who are out anyway are encouraged to always kill a lionfish if they come across one, and qualified divers as well who are who have experience with fear fishing technology are also able. People are kind of encouraged to. You don't need a license. You don't need any kind of special. Um, what's the word? Permit? Permission. Yeah, permit. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> And so maybe for again. those of you who haven't <laughs> seen a lionfish, because they are quite impressive, so mm. we're going to show you a picture of one on the screen now. So they've got these amazing kind of fin... What would you call them? Spines? They're fins? spines, like, yeah. Spines, so yeah, got sticking spines. out everywhere. And they are um, venomous, um, so you don't want to get spined by a lionfish. Are there, um, so... are there native lionfish in the Caribbean? No. Oh, so they're really Not... obvious that they're out of place. You don't have to compare yeah. it to a native species. You can just see it I'm... and go, oh, zap. Yeah, I'm fair. I'm like 99% sure that there's no native species there. Um, but if I'm wrong, then please, someone let me know. <laughs> um, but there, yeah, there are conservation initiatives encouraging people to um, eat them um so that they're not wasted including local restaurants um which is quite nice i think you know hmm. if you're gonna cull them you might as well eat them um which sounds really harsh <laughs> um <laughs> no but i definitely think that could help if there was a market for them in in restaurants and for people eating them that'd be even more of an incentive to remove even more from the oceans which yeah, is which exactly. is which is kind of why even as a you know i try to be as vegetarian as possible in my life but I'm actually for a bigger venison industry in the UK because if we're culling all these deer, well, at least let's eat the meat and then that could, you know, promote a low carbon alternative to beef. Um, yeah. So I'm actually all for people eating more venison in the UK because waste not, want not, if you're going to shoot all these deer, you might as well feed people at the same time. Yeah, I feel similarly. I think if I, I have a plant-based diet, but if I was in the Caribbean, I would eat um, mm. invasive lionfish, I think. Um, if it was available to me. Um, another example of invasive species who are quite a strong candidate for culling are the Burmese pythons in Florida. Um, How they did have... they get there? I think it was I Hurricane think Katrina. It was, the... was it? Because I think I... Katrina burst all these kind of pet shops. Yeah, the so it's through the pet trade. Slithering out. I was, I was going to say, I thought it was the pet trade. <laughs> the the, the yeah. hurricane didn't pick them up from Burma and <laughs> yeah. just like, Whoa. can you imagine these snakes yeah. in the clouds going, Whoa. <laughs> I knew that's not what you meant, but I just was like, how is Hurricane Katrina? Um, yeah, they came to Florida, to America through the pet trade. Um, and then, yeah, it's releasing pets, which is a really common, mm. a surprisingly common um reason for invasive species is people releasing their pets um this if it was the katrina uh, hurricane katrina then at least that was accidental um but they have become one of the most concerning invasive species um in the everglades national park um they compete with native wildlife for food um including mammals birds and other reptiles they have even been known to prey on alligators and they have no natural predators wow. in South Florida. Burmese, Burmese yeah. pythons are a pretty big snake. They're a, they're a really serious snake and because they have no natural predators, they have exploded. Mm. And the, this has led to severe mammal declines in the Everglades National Park. So a 2012 study found that the populations of raccoons had dropped 99.3% since 1997. Opossums dropped ninety eight point nine percent, and bobcats eighty seven point five percent. Wow, um, that's so a lot. Serious numbers, yeah. And marsh rabbits, cottontail rabbits, and foxes have effectively disappeared from the park, Blimey. and this has all been directly linked to the Burmese pythons. So, there are ongoing efforts to remove these pythons to prevent further ecological damage, and so you can pythons can be human human. Bleh. Pythons can be humanely killed on private land at any time with landowner permission. So you don't need a permit or a hunting license. And people are actively encouraged if they come across a python on private land to remove it and kill it. Do you know In how they kill it? Just out of curiosity. Because I don't know whether like shooting. shoot shooting. Okay. Yeah, they shoot them. I think you can also chop their heads off. I think that's 
considered a humane way to kill snakes. Um, but I think the majority of when it's just members of the public, it's through shooting them in the head. Okay. And it's what I mean, everyone in Florida has a gun, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's kind of accepted that a lot of people will have guns. Um, Although that's actually quite an interesting point, you know. It's probably a lot easier... I say a lot easier. I think we'd, even if pythons could survive in Britain, which they, I don't think they could, it would probably be a lot easier to get the public engaged with their control in somewhere like America, where a lot, you know, a lot of people do have guns. So you could mobilise a really nice kind of, I say nice, you could mobilise a really effective grassroots local engagement uh, culling campaign there, um, which I think could be quite effective. I don't know, how, how is this python cull going? Well... Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that says a lot. <laughs> well, it's hard to say because the issue with these pythons is that we don't know how many there are. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to evaluate the success of the culling program. In 2020, uh, two Florida agencies confirmed that 5,000 pythons had been removed. Um, and that was all I got from the article but i think when they're saying removed here they are talking about a combination of both mm -hmm. capture and kill but it's hard to know what proportion of the population that is um but parts of the effort of the culling are not just it's not just local people so the agencies are hiring hunters they are also investing in near infrared technology to better see the snakes. And they're also training python sniffer dogs to wow. try and locate these snakes, which I think could be a really successful tool mm. to kind of up their chances of finding more and also getting a population estimate. Mm. They even um, tested mercury levels in the snakes to see if they would be safe for people to eat, um, which same with the lionfish would kind of hopefully incentivize more people to hunt and eat them but the uh, mercury levels were quite a bit higher than what is generally considered safe for human consumption so that was scrapped which i'm now slightly worried about because when we visited florida we went to a restaurant and we were aware of this python thing and they were advertising yeah i think it was like python nuggets and we were like oh that's a great idea let's let's do it let's you know help towards getting rid of these invasive species so i actually ate some so now i'm slightly worried i've been mercury poisoned um i hope you have yeah <laughs> i think but you know you what know. we move on we move on <laughs> yeah i think we just have to hope you'd you'd know by now and <laughs> <Thanks>. um, <laughs> um i think i'm sure just a couple nuggets is is not going to be a huge problem but maybe imagine if i got killed by a couple of nuggets to, that would be a shame to, you, you were trying to do your bit and save an invasive and that would, species <laughs> get rid of an invasive species yeah. there's no justice in this world <laughs> yeah we can add that to the list of the the problems with pythons is that they're killing conservationists who are trying to eat oh, them oh god <laughs> um, but i think overall um these pythons are a strong candidate for culling despite the ethics of culling being debatable the damage that these pythons are causing is, is overwhelming and they do exist in their mm. native range um so they are from southeast asia and although classed as vulnerable culling the florida population does not influence the conservation status of the species and allowing a species mm. to become invasive mm. somewhere new will never and has never been a response <laughs> to declining in a native range moving species back into the range as they are currently extinct but used to live in yes and sometimes introducing them into new areas is looked into but if it is ever found that they are have potential to become invasive that's not conservation and so killing culling florida's pythons does not influence the population in southeast asia at all or the conservation status of the animals and if you go on the iucn red list website and look at the population at the um geographic range of burmese pythons doesn't mention florida because yeah. it's not part of their range so and i, I guess it would be worth noting that if you know you did want to move pythons from florida back to southeast asia you'd have to fly 5,000 pythons on a plane from Miami to Myanmar, which mm. is exactly the plot of Snakes in a Plane. And we know how that <laughs> went. So, <laughs> Yeah, I think the, the idea of catching them to release them back in Southeast Asia is not... It's gonna. It's just crazy. Yeah. I think it'd be so expensive and so difficult. When really, it'd be better putting that time and money into just conserving them in their natural habitat. Yeah. 
It's almost a shame, though, with the Mercury study that it came back as it did. I'll say. Um, because well, no, other than I don't want you to die, Roby. Um, <laughs> it's a real shame, I think. <laughs> but <laughs> it's like it almost seems a waste if, yeah. if you're culling that many animals without another purpose of, of eating them. Or I guess with snakes, you could go back to... you. They have used the, the skin before for making boots and things like that. Yeah. So it could be like ethical snake boots, maybe. Yeah. Like something like that. Ethical snake. Yeah. There's a snake in my boot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we walked into that one. We walked into that one. Um, so, yes, and obviously it's very easy. Okay, it's very easy. Pythons, are, pythons and lionfish are probably the two scenarios where it would be easiest to say that culling is necessity a necessity because they're invasive species. They've not been... Um, they've never been native in that environment and they're having really bad effects on the native environment. But... Invasive species don't have to be wild animals. They can also be domestic ones, can't they? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the best case of that is um, with this mass um, culling of these invasive goats Ooh. that happened on the island of Santiago in um, on the Galapagos Islands. Not the goats which invaded that Welsh town in the first lockdown. <laughs> oh, they're back. They're back. they back. I saw the other day, yeah. So at the you know, time of recording, which is we're in lockdown three, um, oh my God, they're yeah, back. they're back. I saw the other day. Great. Yeah, because our, our friend lives in that village, one yeah. of our friends Yay. from university, and he's like, they're everywhere and they eat everything. <laughs> but that's a very good point. Goats eat everything, and yes, on the Galapagos, that's a bad thing, isn't it? Yes, it. They caused havoc, to put it lightly. Um, so basically, because they were introduced when people started settling on the island, they weren't originally there. They just grazed and ate almost everything so this started to result in things like erosion and it was actually threatening the survival of some of the rare that rare plant species on the island and also beyond that they actually began to start competing with native fauna for for food so the giant tortoises which also feed on a variety of different plant species were being outcompeted by goats hmm. um and so when they realised this was a problem, they undertook what was the largest eradication programme of a mammal species ever on an island. Um, so just to give you a scale of, wow. of how big it was, so 80,000 goats were eradicated in 52 months. Wow. Um, That's a lot of so... goat curry. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was distribution efforts in the, in the mm. communities to get this goat meat eaten and, mm. and used. Um, and kind of like you were saying with the horses, Roby, the way that they did this was um, with helicopters. Oh, wow. Um, so it was helicopters with rifles, which and then they, they then shot them from the air. But what proved to be the hardest and what actually <clears throat> cost them the most money was the removal of the last 1,000 goats mm -hmm. because they were really, really hard to, to locate. So the project cost around $6 million overall, and most of that was on these last thousand goats. So what they did, which was quite, I don't know, if you call it creative, what you <laughs> want to call it, how, how they lured these final thousand out. So they had what was called Judas goats. Um, <laughs> I love it. I love so it. <laughs> these were Where goats. Where was this going? <laughs> <laughs> so these were goats that were fitted with radio collars and because they then would go back to where the groups of goats were, they basically tracked them and then found the last few goats through these Judas goats with radio collars. Oh my God, um, that's, that, so that sounds wow. really harsh, but It does sound necessary. quite cynical, but it's yeah. like it almost makes it takes the blame off of humans if you get a goat to do it. Um, <laughs> right, let's but... just divert the blame. <laughs> that is really clever. Mm. Um, like that is Cause, really, yeah, that's wow. <laughs> And even more, they had yet another version of these trickster goats um, called Matahari goats. Um, and so these were basically sterilized female goats, which were chemically induced into estrus. And so they oh, were I released. Mean. And then all the, the shy kind of male goats, which didn't previously come out, were obviously very attracted to this um, sterilized female goat. And so they then all come out, came out. So yeah, he had a so, lot of um. They, these were oh. Queen of Sheba goats. Yes. So, that was so what <laughs> happened? Do you know what happened to the Judas and Matai goats? Matahari, sorry. Um, I'm not sure whether they would have been ultimately 
killed or if they were just moved off the island because if there were so few they could have possibly just be returned to the, the main island or I, yeah. i'm not actually sure what happened not sure. to them. yeah mind you um, i guess if the females were sterilized you could just leave them and they'd die out naturally yeah yeah no, that, that's a point and, um, and has it worked this cull because you know this galapagos one of the most incredibly endemic and valuable places of biodiversity in the world you want to preserve it has this has this worked it seems like the the one time where yeah culling would be really worth it yeah no it has been very successful and this is in my mind a, a case where culling I, I can't really see an alternative here other than yeah you could possibly put them all on boats and ship them but where are you going to take them um and also if local communities are getting meat and food that's also another positive so since their eradication, the sort of plant life has recovered. Some of the, the rarer native species have bounced back. And also they've then seen an increase in bird populations as well because you've got more more plant growth. And now the tortoises, I don't know how you measure tortoise happiness, but <laughs> the, the, the fact that they now are not competing with goats, I mm. think, is, is a positive for, for that iconic species as well. Yeah, I think all of these three uh, examples kind of show where the the, the difficulty with culling is, is because mm. obviously it's sad if you care about animal welfare on, on any level it's sad to kill any individual and ideally we wouldn't ever even talk about it but when it comes to invasives you are it, these animal <laughs> killing one saves hundreds and it's there's always you could always have someone you know sitting on your shoulder saying but you could just take them back to where they came from but <laughs> that's so unrealistic in the real world it would be so expensive and so difficult to know that you got them all and got them safely back and that that money and re- other resources would just be so much better spent on trying to conserve animals who are already in their native habitat and it's a shame that you have to lose some individuals but i think it's, it's just a harsh reality of the world we live in i think all three of those examples just show that the money and resources spent on invasive species is so it's always so sad because that you're spending what six million dollars removing invasive goats six million dollars that could have been spent on galapagos conservation Mm. has been just spent on removing goats Mm. but i think yeah we have to think what's at stake as well when it comes to what what if we don't remove these species this is entire ecosystems and entire food webs and networks of of other species which we would lose if we didn't cull so just something to think about what we would lose if we let them go free and just don't do anything yeah and the majority of invasive species are the vast vast majority it's our fault we introduced them they either deliberately or accidentally they came on our boats or through pet trades and so we cause these problems and so we do have a responsibility to fix them or try to fix them absolutely and the kind of what we're going to talk to you about now is the third uh and in my opinion the most um tenuous situation under which you might use culling and that is as a method of disease control so culling has been used to prevent the spread of disease before um, both within populations and to prevent cross-contamination between species such as humans and wildlife and then wildlife and domestic animals or this zoonotic transmission of disease um, so in southern africa in 20th century it was used in a kind of wildlife livestock scenario um, and culling was actually used to create these wildlife free corridors which is just such a uh, complete turnaround from what we talk about now which is the creation of wildlife corridors um but it was used then to allow cattle farms to uh, prevent the spread of diseases between between them um and i think six six hundred and sixty thousand animals were killed across culled across 36 species including species like elephants and black rhino everything um, about that example is bonkers just- puts me on edge yeah like yeah the term wildlife free corridors i know no just, i don't like that just, <laughs> i just want to go back in time and be like don't do it yeah <laughs> yeah and even more closer to home in both geography and time in the 1960s red foxes were culled to control rabies um there is no you know effective wildlife vaccine for rabies so culling was the only way to control the spread of this disease um and obviously you don't want anyone to get rabies be it animal or um 
human. And so now we're going to come to badgers and the badger cull in Britain, which we've actually spoken about quite a lot before. We've been very critical of the badger cull. Um, and that's because just before Emma take, shows you a little bit more detail of the badger cull, um, culling as a method of disease control, I'm not convinced by the evidence for it. I think it's the wrong solution for the problem you wouldn't suggest culling people to spread to stop the spread of an invasive disease for instance covid that we have at the moment um and i think if you talk to any epidemiologist it, they would tell you that wouldn't actually s slow the spread of the disease um so yeah i am quite critical of culling as a method of disease control but emma do you want to just kind of run us through the badger cull and and, yeah. and what we what we understand about that I mean, just to say first, I, I agree with you fully. I don't, I think there is a place in conservation, maybe where humans have interfered beyond point, point of no return, where culling might be considered as an option. But with disease control, I'm, I'm less convinced. Um, so just to, yeah, highlight an example with badgers, we've got loads more information in another podcast we did. So feel free to listen to that. Um, so it's kind of, I feel like we've maybe all agree on this, that sometimes culling to prevent the spread of diseases may be ill-informed and largely ineffective. So with the badger cull, just a brief overview of what it was designed to do, it was basically the plan was to limit or, or prevent the spread of bovine TB, um, which is a cattle disease, but badgers are um, can be a reservoir host of the disease. Um, but just to note that over 95% of the transmissions of this disease are between cattle and cattle. There's very, very few incidences of badgers actually spreading it um, to cattle. Um, and there was a massive eight year long study. So really, really comprehensive study involving lots of different um, areas in the UK, lots of different scientists in this community. And basically the overall conclusion from this was that Badger culling can make no meaningful contribution to cattle TB control in Britain. So I think ultimately, we've, we've talked about this before, but bovine TB is a cattle problem and the solution lies in cattle. Culling badgers is just making them the scapegoats kind of in, in this situation so that farmers and landowners who are devastated by this, it's a, it's a horrible disease, but they almost have, have something or an animal to blame um, I, th I think badgers a little bit in a, a little bit in how we've you know we talked to, uh, in our podcast about trophy hunting about it's very easy to take issue with trophy hunting because it has a face and mm. it's very easy to point and say that's wrong and I feel like a similar situation has happened with badgers and that okay badgers have a face and we can point at them and say oh disease we should cull them um, and it's probably a lot easier to say that than to invest a whole lot of money in cattle vaccinations and mm. changing cattle movement practices. Um, yeah, it definitely feels like mm. a we need to be seen to be doing something. So let's cull badgers rather than any evidence based decision making at all. So, yeah, overall, the badger culling is strongly opposed by scientists, conservationists, the British Veterinary Association and the majority of the public because... There's just very, very, if not no, scientific ed evidence that culling actually makes things better. It makes things worse because the badgers spread out more, it changes their behaviour, and then TB just spreads even further. So yeah, highly critical of culling as a means to, to control badger mm. numbers. Yeah, I definitely agree with you both um, on that. And I agree in general that I think culling as a, compared to especially having just spoken about invasive species the comparison is just ridiculous um and it's not an ideal method of disease control i do think rabies is the possibly the only caveat to that um where i can see the benefit of culling rabies but that's infect animals that are already infected because as you said you can't there's not really anything else you can do and it's i think almost kinder to the animal to kill them than to allow them to continue ex to like to die from rabies i think that's really quite heart horrible um but i don't think there's not really any way to kind of prevent the spread of rabies through randomly culling which seems to be what they're trying to do <laughs> with the badgers um so it's more kind of killing infected animals of highly infectious diseases that don't have a cure i can see the benefit behind doing that but otherwise 
I don't think it helps prevent the spread of disease. So we've laid out for you there kind of three scenarios under which you might um, engage in culling if you're a conservationist or a governmental department charged with wildlife management. And they are population control, control of invasive species and disease control. And so we hope we've laid out, you know, you can make quite a strong case in population control and invasive species control scenarios. Um, We feel a lot less strongly about the use of culling for disease control. But obviously, culling is a very emotive issue. I would, you know, maybe maybe I would be able to, as if I was working as a conservationist and someone said, right, we've got too many goats to save the Galapagos, can you help us shoot them? I don't know, I, I don't want to ask that question of myself and I certainly couldn't go out and just shoot a badger. Um, and so why don't we now look at some of the alternatives to culling? And there are kind of, there are kind of um, three main alternatives in 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 a kind of population control scenario um translocation of animals is is an is an alternative option so instead of culling them in one area you'd take the excess um that you'd from from one park and move it to another national park for instance you'd actually probably take a bit more than the excess because otherwise that number would just be reached very quickly again um for something like an invasive species something like biocontrol Uh, could be used so introducing an animal which would you know almost solely predate on the invasive species although you then do run the risk of that biocontrol being invasive and becoming a a problem to the environment so that's something that has to be thought about really carefully Um, and then finally the last one again on a population control is actually non-lethal population management stuff like sterilization spaying and neutering of individuals um so we're going to take you through each of those uh and we're going to lay out kind of the strengths and some of the weaknesses for it um and the first one we're going to talk about is translocation um as an as, as a kind of an alternative to culling in a kind of population control scenario and i think kate is going to talk to you about elephants Yes, I am. So yeah, as Roby just kind of said, a brief definition of translocation is the deliberate and mediated movement of wild individuals or populations from one part of their range to another. Um, So critical point there that are staying within their range and not becoming invasive. (laughs) Um, Commonly used tool in conservation for establishing and re-establishing or augmenting populations of managed species. Um, However, it's also used to manage problem wildlife um although several studies have questioned its context in this use um sorry questions (laughs) its use although several studies have questioned its use in this context um problem wildlife is basically if you've got an in an individual animal or a group of animals that are causing excessive issues so typically a lot of human wildlife conflict then they become a problem that has to be managed Translocations are a good option if you've got another national park who is below carrying capacity of your species and needs you need to reduce your size and they would take yours. However, big cons of translocations is that it is incredibly expensive and sometimes it's not an option. Sometimes you don't have anyone who's willing to take what you're willing to offer. So we mentioned earlier about elephants being a keystone species, but the problems associated with them and elephants can sometimes be seen as these problem animals and elephants have been translocated um, around Africa before translocation has been used as a management tool in elephant conservation for years translocating problem elephants aims to mitigate the conflict by removing them from human proximity and it also attempts to further elephant conservation assuming higher mortality if problem elephants remain in their original home ranges The kind of modus operandi um, of translocating elephants is to capture them um, by darting them and so sedating them and then transporting them by a truck and then releasing them into a protected area. Um, Sometimes on the release they are just immediately let into their new space but often they're put into a temporary boma so they can get used to their original surroundings before being let into the kind of wider area. Mm. In Sri Lanka and India, elephants translocations is exclusively with males um, but in Malaysia, Indonesia and then African countries it can involve both sexes. I'm not sure why Sri Lanka and India 
stick to males um, might be th- to do with this problem thing. I think you know, in, Roby. I think in Sri Lanka and India, it's usually because they view at least um, individual males as easier to translocate than, for instance, a whole family unit. Obviously, male elephants tend to be solitary, whereas family units tend to be. Um, there's much more of them. There is also the case to be made that male elephants, especially young males, tend to have more of a potential for human wildlife conflict because obviously they're driven to disperse to new areas away from their family groups. Um, They're also driven to disperse by the presence of older, more dominant bulls. So they're generally more wide ranging. And whereas a family unit might stick to its ancestral roaming grounds, these males have to go off in all different directions and they're quite... You know, young males are quite boisterous in quite a few mam- mammalian species. Um, however, the co- the flip side of that is why you might also want to do it with both family groups and females is that obviously elephant calves stay with their mothers for an extremely long time, um, both male and female, and they 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 learn. We know elephants learn, and so if a if a big female matriarch starts to learn crop raiding behaviour or learning how to take plantations and you know go in the wrong places she will pass that knowledge down to the other lower ranking and younger animals in her social network and so it, yeah it's probably cheaper and maybe more effective in the short term to only translocate males but i do think and this is me personally i don't work in elephant conservation i do think you might miss at least half of the problem if you don't also tackle the fact that animals learn problem behavior from their mothers in in the case of elephants yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So considering the resources needed and the stakes involved in elephant translocation, there is a real need for really sound science to inform release efforts, which is not specific to elephants. That's pretty much always the case. Um, but as Roby just sort of mentioned, elephants do live in these familial structures and they are extremely social. And although this is typically family groups, Elephants have been known to develop really strong social bonds with non-family members as well. And their reliance on sociality is and it must be considered during translocation efforts. So results of elephant translocations do vary. A paper by Fernando et al, um, which had the very catchy title of Problem Elephant Translocating, Translocating the Problem and the elephant oh Ooh, i love again. that <laughs> i know it's good isn't it oh, i love it when it. you see a, a paper which is they, they've just kind of thought oh yeah we can get a pun in here it's great that's yeah i love that <laughs> there was a great one which uh I, I think we it's, put it's... in the references for shark culling where the paper was talking about rogue shark theory and it was flaws the problems in shark and human conflict and i was like yeah great oh, <laughs> brilliant. yes yeah and i thought this was quite clever because they're kind of touching on what you just said roby is is it are you translocating when you're translocating problem animals what are you trying to get rid of the animal or the problem um and so what this study did was they monitored 16 translocations in sri lanka and all of those translocations were into national parks so the majority of elephants post-release began removing towards their capture site or previous home and this Mm. phenomenon was also documented by lawrence anthony in his book the elephant whisperer which Side note, if you guys haven't read, um, I wholeheartedly recommend all of Lawrence Anthony's books. Ooh, who is um, he? I think I read one of his... I read one of... I think I might have read The Elephant Whisperer. Yeah, so he's... So good. He's a... Um, he's unfortunately passed away now, but he was a, an African conservationist who owns a reserve in South Africa. And he basically rehomed an, a problem elephant population that were going to be shot. And The Elephant Whisperer documents his story of that whole adventure did um, he did he also do something with rhinos yes he's written think, three books i think so, i've heard of him in rhino context yeah the elephant whisperer the last rhinos and babylon's ark and i really recommend them all they're really good books Ooh, that's um, in the elephant whisperer uh, Lawrence anthony's elephants actually broke through electric fences um the first night that he had them to try and go home and they when he looked at the map he realized that they were heading straight towards where they had come from which was obviously the other side of the country really far away there was no way they were going to get there in one night but they they have they're so intelligent that they knew the exact bearing to take Mm. and that's where they were going so uh fernando al's study found that some elephants did settle at their release location but there was variability in individual response 
and they said that individual response to translocation may be related to environmental factors so you know resource availability at the capture site or the release site um physiographic and anthropogenic barriers um it could be to do with behavioral factors such as social status um or just innate factors such as the physiological and psychological state of the individuals um however a lot of these things are hard to test empirically and i think it's interesting because the variation between individuals suggests to me that it is hard to then predict how Mm. a translocation is going to go unless you really know the individuals um but that again that would only really work if you're talking about the psychological state of those animals this study found that overall problem elephant translocation actually just intensified human elephant conflict um so if the aim of your translocation is to diminish this then it may not be a successful alternative to culling they also found that translocation greatly reduced the elephant's survival so translocations as Roby you mentioned before with um the horses example Translocations have a mortality rate of 6% during capture and transport. And in this study, a 42% mortality rate of adult elephants post-release was found. Wow. Again, that's suggests- really high. Really high. Um, so it again suggests that the best it might not be the best alternative for culling problem animals. If they're going to die anyway, do you want to spend all this money, resources and stress on these animals? Mm. So maybe um, so maybe it's not so good in a problem animal context, but perhaps do you think it could still have a place in, say, if there's just too many elephants in one area, moving them? Yeah, yeah. I think um, in the problem animal context, it's in with elephants, it's not a great alternative to culling. But in or, in reducing population size, I do think translocations have their place. Um, translocations mm-hmm. also have their place in conservation for in just improving genetic diversity and kind mm. of trying to mimic natural gene flow in when you're talking about areas that are fenced off or allowing species to re-establish in areas that they used to be uh, they used to inhabit but are now have been driven out of due to anthropogenic reasons most likely because there have been some really successful ones i think i mean at least ones that you see kind of in in the news like with things with giraffes i think there were some that was quite successful um, obviously yeah. some elephant groups don't just want to go home they will eventually settle so yeah yeah um so Lawrence Anthony's um story was a success story in the end um he took on problem elephants who would have been shot and he developed a relationship with them and they're still thriving on his reserve today hmm. um but it took a lot of time patience and at least two broke breakouts and broken electric fences um so if you've got the resources available to you then fine but i think uh, beyond elephants there's other um animals that are good candidate for translocations the wwf has a project working with black rhinos called the black rhino range expansion project which uh, operates mostly in kwazulu natal province of south africa and that is aiming to increase the range of black rhinos and to increase genetic diversity and that's been incredibly successful there are ethical concerns with translocation as there are with culling so with elephants translocation does cause elephants to behave abnormally increases their mortality and does subject the individuals to extreme stress Um, Translocation of any wild animal is incredibly stressful And given the social structures of elephants, translocations can disrupt this at both the capture and release site. So even if you do translocate the entire family, which is unlikely due to costs, but it does happen, you are now disturbing the elephant population at the release site because elephants do establish home ranges and social structures. And so you're now bringing a new group of elephants into an already occupied space, unless, of course, you're moving them to a reserve that has no elephants. In which case, you're still disrupting that ecosystem by now bringing in incredibly disruptive animals. But in in the Lawrence Anthony example, elephants used to live there. It, it was actually a good thing to bring them back. So I think translocations are a valuable tool for conservation. And I would advocate for cu- them over culling in a lot of circumstances. But yeah, this researching this podcast has shown for me that for problem animals, uh, translocation is not necessarily better than culling. And I do think that it is a case by case hmm. basis as, that you have to make is, these decisions. As is so often the case, no pun yeah. intended. 
Yeah, that was exactly. completely intended. It was a completely intended pun. All of yours are intended. Mine are yeah, completely no. unintentional. I'm like, what pun? Huh? <laughs> yeah, so I think overall it's you have to look at it on yeah uh, yeah one at a time unfortunately (laughs) yeah no i would i would completely agree and i think it so depends on in not only individuals within a group but also individual populations individual countries how you are to tackle for problem animals for example um so i guess another method a non-lethal control method that we can talk about is sort of sterilization or I guess use of contraceptives and things like that um which was a something that was quite controversial recently with regards to controlling squirrel um gray squirrel numbers here in the uk um but if we talk about so there's a good example of sterilization in camels um which was proposed in australia so just a bit of background on camels because why not they're really cool love a camel Um, (laughs) <laughs> they evolved in North America, but they now predominantly live in North Africa. Um, so that's kind of where they originated, where they are now. Um, but they were introduced into Australia in the 1840s up to the early 1900s. Um, and this was mainly as a result of the massive gold rushes that they had there. So this was for transport and sort of hauling cargo um, and just, yeah, helping people move heavy equipment and things like that. But once in the 1930s, sort of when you had motor vehicles and trains, the camels weren't really needed anymore because it was a lot more efficient to do things with with vehicles rather than camels. So about 5,000 of these captive camels were just released into the Australian wilderness. Um, So you might have picked up there, they're not native to that (laughs) part of the world um and kind of like the example with um well i guess with any of the ones we've talked about to be honest maybe with the pythons where it's suddenly you've got really no natural predators high abundance of food all this space and they're like great and the camels just took this as a opportunity to basically increase exponentially in in populations and they're now over a million camels in australia um wow that's a lot of camels <laughs> and you know it's worth noting that australia did used to have large mammalian megafauna it had giant wombats and giant kangaroos and things um i know it sounds like i'm making them out i actually not look up <laughs> i want to look up it a... was huge oh it yeah a... they were crazy yeah wombat the size of a rhino and these would have had you know very significant grazing pressures on the environment which would naturally be kept in check by things like predation and climate stuff uh and so you could argue that all these feral camels and feral horses in australia are mimicking that but the trouble is they were all marsupials these are placental mammals and they would have had completely different life step life cycles completely different ecologies they would have interacted with the plants in a different way so as as lovely as it is to think you know from a rewilding point of view great we've got megafauna in australia again it's 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 the wrong megafauna. We need the mm. giant wombats. We can't have these camels and, and horses. I wish we still had giant wombats. Be they great, are absolutely it? epic. <laughs> um, but yeah, like you say, they've kind of now kind of become a pest and they're really damaging the environment through overgrazing, trampling, damaging fences. Like they, they're quite, um, they cause a lot of problems to say the least. Um, And one issue that they had when looking at culling as a means of of controlling them is that they spread out over really large areas and they don't visit things like watering holes that frequently. So it's really hard to sort of pinpoint them and say shoot them because it's just a huge range and it'd be really expensive. So another alternative they were looking at is is sterilising them. So basically sterilising the females to see if this could result in, in population reductions. But again that that has its challenges like how you go how are you going to deliver this the contraceptive or sterilization would it be darting would it be food baiting it, it's still logistically challenging and we did this this is from a lecturer at university um was kind of saying that they've done all of this what's called elasticity analysis so looking at what influences population growth and what would cause population growth to decline things like that 
And so they found that adult survival in camels was the, the biggest influence on, on population growth rate. So they kind of concluded that you'd need to reduce adult camel survival by 9% just to halt population growth. So kind of when you think about that, a reduction in, in adult camel survival, that would be something like culling. That would be a okay. method to, to use there. Whereas when they looked at sterilizing females, they basically said that you would need to sterilize over 70% of the female camel population to start bringing the, the population growth rate down. Wow. So as, as nice as it sounds that we have this non-lethal alternative, it's logistically a nightmare. Hmm. And to, to sterilize 70% of the female camels, that's a huge task, whereas you'd only need to influence camel adult survival rate by 9% through something like culling to have a similar effect. And it would so probably basically, be cheaper, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So kind of, it's an idea. It might work for some species, but with camels, they've kind of said that, yeah, this, this could be a bit too much, biting off more than we can chew in terms of sterilization. Although to give, a, to give an example of a species where stuff, where, you know, non-lethal control methods have worked. So white-tailed deer in Fairfax, Virginia, um, with the extinction of both wolf populations in the area and the eastern population of Puma, uh, their numbers were very heavily increasing to a detrimental level. Um, and they actually used trapping, spaying and neutering and then release uh, of these individuals. And l last I heard, and this was, I think, a 2008 study, it had reduced the population size by 28% over five years. So okay. it's it's not completely outlandish, but the fact, but you know, evidently it gets to a stage with camels where there's just so many that mm. it's not feasible. And, and perhaps, that's interesting, looking at the elasticity of it, that, that actually it's adult survival, not reproduction, which affects population growth. Mm. Yeah, no, I think it's that's when you need to understand demographics and population. Mm. Um, so, yeah, do we maybe want to talk about another type of, of non-lethal control? Sure. Do you want to talk about biocontrol? I suppose biocontrol is non-lethal on the point of it's not the humans doing the killing, but I suppose <laughs> you are kind of, you're kind of angling for something to eat the invasives anyway. Um, so an alternative to culling, in a, to culling a, a problem species would be introducing another animal to eat it. Now, this might be reintroduction of a native predator. We're all for that with the reintroduction of British native predators to control deer species and alternative to culling. Um, but you also have to be very careful. And what happened in Australia, we're talking about Australia a lot, and that's interesting yeah. because it's quite, it's a very endemic place. Its fauna is very isolated and unique. So actually, there's, it's quite easy for an introduced species to become invasive. So cane toads, Rhinella marina, moved recently from the genus Bufo, which is why you might not recognise that. Um, native to South and Central America, but were introduced to Australia in 1930s as a method of biocontrol to control the native cane beetle, Dermolipida alboritum, which is a sugarcane pest. But so it went wrong, didn't it? Spectacularly. <laughs> spectacularly wrong. Um, there was precedent, though. Uh, the South American cactus moth, with the fantastic Latin name of Cactoblastic Cactorum. Oh my um, god, yes, love it. Was <laughs> brought in it. to successfully control invasive prickly pears. Uh, the cane toads were brought in to control a native species, a, a crop pest. It didn't work, they didn't control the native species, and there are now upwards of 200 million of them. Oh my goodness. This is bad. Mm. They spread diseases between themselves and local diversity. And they're also poisonous, really quite poisonous. Um, and so native carnivorous animals in Australia, stuff like native uh, possum species, which are already very endangered, um, monitor lizards, freshwater turtles, crocodiles, snakes and skinks, when they eat them, they die. They're very poisonous. And this is having a massive cascading effect on the ecosystem. So uh, a really interesting one I thought is that actually the introduction of cane toads is increasing the incidence of human crocodile conflict because cane toads are poisoning the monitor lizards. There are fewer monitor lizards to raid the crocodile nests. So the saltwater crocodile population is increasing and this is causing more human crocodile conflict, which is just a incredible wow. <laughs> Yeah, knock That's on. like mind blowing of like toad, yeah. crocodiles, humans, yeah. what? And yeah, they're also, it just shows you these things can spiral so quickly. They're also spreading diseases among cattle 
Cane toads are eating dung beetles, so there's less dung recycled in the cattle pastures, so the diseases are moving about. It's a whole thing. Um, <laughs> and so widespread trapping and culling of these species, which yeah, were introduced as biocontrol themselves, has proved ineffective. Um, it's been figured out that the greatest selection pressure on cane toads, because they have no competitors, is intraspecific competition so culling toads is actually increasing the fitness of the unculled toads uh if i say cull and toads any more times my head's going to explode with culled toads um and so there are actually some alternatives being used again the release of sterile males into the population to compete for resources this is now favored because we know that toad competition is the biggest um limiter of populations a bit like adult survival in camels it's not always about reproduction um, and another option is inserting a gene in female toads, which would only allow them to produce male offspring. Uh, and both of these are kind of in the kind of experimental stages. So, wow. yeah, we've given you some alternatives to culling. Um, in some conditions, have... they. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, no. I think I'm a bit delayed. Um, I was. Just... I have to say, I do quite like the idea of biocontrol um i think just because i do think nature will always be able to sort itself out better than we can ever sort it out yeah Um, (laughs) but i do think that it's incredibly difficult to get right and Mm. i think when it goes well it's incredible it goes really well and it's amazing and it's really cost effective but it's it's hard because you have to do so much research and when you're introducing anything deliberately into an ecosystem you have to be really careful not to let it become invasive mm. and it's 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 hard um i think it involves a lot of research and a lot of um expertise but i do think when it works it's an incredible alternative to culling mm. so how f- oh the, sorry another thing i just wanted to say was it's not always a predator you can release sometimes parasites as well Mm. um and that has been that's happened in south africa i can't remember the exact species but a parasite to a plant was introduced an invasive plant and that was quite effective at controlling the spread of that plant Mm. Woo, go parasites yeah (laughs) i i really like parasitology i should have put that into context i just find them fascinating (laughs) whereas parasites terrify me so you know we've got a good balance of opinions yeah (laughs) um so we hope that you know through the course of this podcast we've provided you with a lot of examples to kind of make you think about culling we've laid out the scenarios where culling can be employed and why it may or may not be effective under those scenarios. And we've also given you some alternative methods of con- of animal control. And again, we've kind of shown how they can be s- effective and how they can't be effective. So we're going to kind of break it up now and just go- kind of go into a bit of a discussion between us. And this is where we're going to kind of present our thoughts and feelings on the subject. Um, I mean, I think the first thing that kind of popped into my mind when we were discussing this is we talk a lot about introduced species but introduced species can become naturalised in the environment. Like fallow deer in the UK were introduced by the Normans and now they've become naturalised. And so it's kind of, you can see the same thing with horses in the Wild West. Depending on who you ask, they're, an, they're either an invasive pest species, a reintroduced indigenous species, which last went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene, or culturally significant but feral livestock. So how do we deter- how do we kind of discriminate between introduced and naturalized and invasive species i think is quite an interesting point i think it's a really hard question to answer because i think the question of baselines and where to draw Mm. your baseline is um it's it again it it depends i think it's different for different ecosystems and for different species um so it is quite hard i do think it does have an impact on how i feel about Mm. culling um and I think again, it's it it's case specific, um, and I think it is a really interesting question, but it's also a really difficult question to answer, and it's sort of a rabbit hole that mm. sometimes is too hard to go down um, because you sometimes need to just make faster decisions, and you don't have the luxury of time to really analyse yeah where the the kind of history of the invasion or the the reintroduction or introduction um 
so I don't I don't really have I mean, an answer do... <laughs> I don't know I think uh, my point my point with horses where I would stand on horses would probably be I would be opposed to their presence in Australia where large placental mammals mammal, mammalian grazers have never been native in America you know on the topic of rewilding I wouldn't be so opposed to having wild horses they you know they did exist in the Pleistocene but I think if you were going to have wild horses in North America you'd have to bring back their natural predators be that you know you know really strong conservation of wolf numbers to get wolves running about everywhere or um you know puma okay you could introduce reintroduce lions to America that would be I think that would be a step too far, but you know, it, maybe it's a thought experiment. They we used to have Pleistocene lions in America. Um, what do you think, Emma, with the whole kind of naturalized, introduced question? I think it's very, very challenging, as we've all kind of come to realise that. And I think it really depends who you ask, mm. because for some people, like with the horses, if it's become part of your culture and it's all you've ever known that they've been there, and I think, yeah, like you were saying, Kate, you always have to weigh it up case by case. Sometimes it's really, really obvious when a species is invasive and causing so much more harm than good. If it's a, it, it might be causing harm, but we can manage it, then it's like, okay, maybe we should allow them to just... They're, they're naturalised now, they've been here for thousands of years, let's just leave them. But if they're doing way more harm than good, I think we kind of have a role to intervene, almost. And And so... The, the next kind of logical point to that, which popped up when we were talking about spearfishing in my head, the spearfishing of the lionfish, like, does the method of culling affect your opinion on, on whether to cull? So I'm just going to play the devil's avocado here. I don't believe this, but it could be argued that in an ideal world, the method of culling should matter. But you could argue that the biodiversity crisis is at such a critical level that we no longer have the luxury of idealism and, and that the ends justify the means. Uh, so, you know, I'm not, I don't believe that, but that is, an, that is an opinion I've come across whilst researching this, this podcast. I mean, I feel like for me personally, the, the method of culling does have an impact as to whether I think it's right or not. Because I think if we don't have a humane way of killing animals, then f research and efforts should be invested into that before we then mass kill a bunch of animals in a really inhumane way because i think this is already such a polarized topic like you've got say animal rights or welfare groups who care very very passionately about animals who would be so opposed to culling like it would never be an answer that they could consider so if not only are you suggesting culling but then on top of that it's not humane and it's not quick and the animal doesn't die straight away you're, you're never gonna have mm. a, a rational conversation are you because like what we're doing today is a debate we're trying to say in some cases this maybe could be a, a, an option but that's never going to happen and you're never going to widen that conversation i think if it's if it's not humane and not quick i i think i largely agree with you i it sort of seems and it's probably easy very easy to sit down and say this rather than to actually go and do this yeah. but it sort of seems that there's no need to have an inhumane method of culling um i think you as you say emma there's you can research and find a humane way or the or the most i guess we should say the most humane way of culling and it seems like you should always aim for that that should always be the standard that is acceptable and anything below that should really be discouraged i think when it comes to talking about what is and isn't humane it's again people will have completely different opinions of this i know that poison is often considered inhumane um but when it comes to rats on islands often it's the kind of only option um and i think sometimes the ends do justify the means um and it sort of pains me to say that a little bit because I, uh, I, 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 in an ideal world, I wouldn't be saying that. But I do, I do sympathise with the argument that you pointed out, Roby, that we have lost the luxury of idealism. And so I think when you're, when the benefits are so great to so many other animals, if you know, you, whilst we should be aiming for the best possible solution and the most humane solution we can 
the most humane might not be considered humane by some people and it's then a question do we go with the best option or do we let it play out as it is which could be potentially even more damaging and more animals could die so I do think the ends justify the mean but we should always be striving for the most humane approach we can I think I, I think I completely agree with you it's quite an unpleasant thing I'm finding this quite an unpleasant thing to say but I do think you have to discriminate between you know I think you do have to discriminate between species so elephants for instance incredibly social uh very intelligent we know they're deeply emotional animals we also know they're incredibly endangered animals so if for whatever reason a cull of elephants was taken forward i think you know we have a moral imperative to ensure that while we are taking these animals lives we have to recognize that they're just as emotional as we are and therefore we have a moral obligation to make sure we do it in the most humane way possible a lot of people interestingly think um you know shooting is the most humane way possible and so i would never condone the use of for instance poison to control elephant numbers but i would make the distinction that on for instance an isolated pacific island with a highly endemic perhaps flightless avian fauna which has no natural defenses to a, a massive infestation of um for uh, polynesian rats the cure or feral ferrets and cats and things in that scenario I would probably, <laughs> it feels weird saying I would condone, I f probably wouldn't oppose the use of poison just because the scale of the problem, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it, you can go out and shoot 10 elephants, but if you turn up with a couple of rifles on Tahiti with a massive population of invasive rats, you're not going to get anywhere. So, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I, I think. Kind of, Sorry. No, no, no. That was kind of the end of my point. It's, it's a really uncomfortable thing to say. To be, to, I think we're at the point now where idealism has gone as far as it can. Yeah, I think we are. We're definitely at that point with the, in a lot of cases, and we're approaching it faster and faster um, in the areas that we're not quite there. I think that raises another kind of interesting question, Roby, of whether the species you're culling affects your opinion on not just the method of culling, but whether or not we should even cull. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's a bit like a bit like if you've watched our trophy hunting episode, my position on culling is, is somewhat similar. I don't think there's an argument to cull endangered species. Even though you've got, okay, elephants in Zimbabwe are not endangered on a national level, globally they are. We know that elephants are more important than for instance polynesian rats so i would say in the case of elephants in zimbabwe we shouldn't cull and we should spend the money on translocation is what i would do um however and we also need to take a step back and consider and consider the fact that well why are there too many elephants is it because we haven't given them enough space and i think it would be worth saying okay can we give more space to elephants um and whereas Actually, you know, I think endangeredness makes more of an impact to me over invasiveness, which is interesting because that mm. might not carry ecological weight. Because, for instance, red deer in Scotland are native and not endangered. Um, and so I, I think I think culling of them is a viable way to control the numbers in the absence of carnivore introduction. And let's face it, even if we did bring wolves and lynx back, they couldn't live everywhere there's only there's not enough habitat they'd live in national parks and what to do about the deer outside of those so for me yes the species being culled does affect my opinion of it i don't think you should cull endangered ones i think if it's a invasive or evasive or native above carrying capacity i i i think culling is a viable option with that yeah i think the species it does also affect my opinion of whether or not to cull the main thing that influences my decision is my opinion is whether or not the decision is rooted in science so it is hard to say which species i'd be okay for and which i wouldn't and i don't think you can have a universal opinion of for and against culling i think once you've looked into at all the evidence i don't think you can sit here and say i'm always against culling or i'm always in favor of culling 
it's as I've said so many times um (laughs) it's case specific (laughs) I definitely have a preference I guess towards culling of invasive species um because I think especially with the examples we've highlighted the benefits to the ecosystem and to the other species massively massively outweigh the the kind of cons of culling um but I don't think culling would be my first choice in a perfect Mm. world but I have accepted a long time ago that we do not live in a perfect world um (laughs) it's been a long lockdown (laughs) yeah we've there's I yeah we've lost idealism within conservation a long time ago and I do accept that a certain level of ecosystem management is necessary due to the level of anthropogenic threat that we place on ecosystems and so we have to have this kind of active involvement which I think ideally we wish we didn't I also think that when it comes to invasives a big reason why I'm more in favor of culling is often culling is cheaper and easier than the alternatives like sterilization and translocation and that money could be so much better spent in my opinion often and I think sometimes when you can just cull and you it's you know it's sad and it's not ideal but the resources that you save the time and money and human effort I think could be better spent on trying to keep ecosystems intact and conserve ecosystems so for me I do think that there is a strong case for culling within conservation in a lot of areas but as long as the decision is rooted in science Mm -hmm. yeah no I would completely agree Um, and I think it's something that's hard to get your head around that we might need to intervene in some ecosystems when we've when we've caused more damage than good it's almost like do we have a moral obligation to then intervene it's like i think for me yeah as well the species does matter when it comes to whether i say it's okay or not to cull but also what the purpose of culling actually is i think matters quite significantly for me so something like we when we talked about use of culling as a means of disease control for something like badgers I just think that it's highly ineffective and that to me is incredibly inhumane and a massive waste of of animal life and also damaging to our ecosystems as well because we have seen examples where culling can assist ecosystem and restore ecosystem function on a, on a large scale but something like the removal of badgers they're they're Britain's largest um, sort of terrestrial carnivals that we have their ecosystem regulators in their own right and colouring in that sense really doesn't sit well for me um Mm. and i mean i do agree with both of you kind of in the sense that invasive species are probably higher up my list of things that we do need to control and possibly culling is is a way to do that but i do think we should consider things like translocation and biocontrol as a as a starting point be like could it be controlled through these methods first if no then okay maybe we can look at culling i do and think um sorry i just had a point about invasive mm-hmm. um i do think with invasives um and i'd be willing to put my hands up and say that i've probably fallen into this trap is that we feel a bit more comfortable killing invasives because we can view them as the bad guys mm. and so we're like they're bad they're causing damage and it's their fault so we should take them out when actually it's probably our fault um (laughs) so i'm not sure that argument really holds water but i think it's a lot easier to feel comfortable when we can kind of place blame almost on these species i think it just helps us feel a little bit better about it and it's interesting you you, and it's interesting that you mentioned the badgers emma because that this is this kind of comes back to i think what the conservation movement gets accused of quite often which is speciesism and I'm sure some of the people watching this might be wondering, well, how can you condemn one cull, the badger cull, while supporting another cull, the deer cull in England, uh, sorry, in, in, in Britain, when these are both native species? Um, and both of the reasons why you would put forward a cull are entirely anthropogenic for both of them. Um, and so it, it can be, it can be very strange to advocate for that i feel a bit weird even though i completely condemn the badger cull and support the deer cull and i'm willing to stand up and say that i do i do still feel weird about it um but i found a really i found a really good article by a reporter i assume he's a reporter called patrick barkham in an article for the guardian in 2013 um and 
he he kind of articulates this 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 um very well and he kind of says that conservation culling is something of an orwellian atrocity uh and there's a speciesism in in action um and in a kind of a moral and ethical level speciesism is i think something to be avoided as much as possible you know i don't think it's right to test medicine on chimps for instance yada 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 um but the risk is that this is quite an emotional argument and i think if you're going to take up conservation you also have to be able to make the distinction between the worth of two animals lives and this is a very hard thing to do um you know for instance in the cases of badgers and deer we do have to be able to distinguish between the worth and the valid the validity of taking those lives um it can be quite hard and he notes again which is something that i've noticed actually reading a book called invasive aliens um on invasive species some of the language in there it's written by a zoologist but some of the language used such as invasive and exotic and stuff like this and patrick barkham notes this as well can stray a little too home too close to home to nationalism and ideas about in britain at least about race and immigration and indeed fascism in some in some cases and so that's why I feel quite uncomfortable sometimes in talking about this, because I don't like how how close the language can mm. cross over, even if the yeah. intent does not. But I think the key point is that for good or for worse, humanity is now in a kind of guardian role of the natural world. And therefore, again, as Patrick Barkham notes, our environmental policy must be to preserve as great a biodiversity of wildlife as possible. And it may mean, I think, that sometimes culling is necessary. Um, but if that if that is a, if if that is done humanely and for the goal of preserving the maximum amount of biodiversity, I I think it, it there is a place for it. Yeah. I just think it's it's a really hard concept to get your head around. It's like for all of us as as conservationists in this field to to try and justify why one animal life matters more than another and i guess to play the ultimate devil's advocate just as a i realize this is probably going to be quite controversial to a lot of people but for people who are meat eaters that in a sense is kind of that is mass killing of animals on a daily basis and that's entirely for human gain there's no environmental or ecosystem kind of benefits that we're getting there so I think it's just something I want to ask viewers and, and listeners is just something to think about is that if you are a meat, meat eater, that maybe it's worth just being maybe looking into culling a bit more and just being open minded to it as a strategy, because on an ecological scale, it can sometimes do have more positives than negatives. So it's just something something to think about, which I know is probably a bit controversial, but in, in my point is in my head is a, a valid point to raise I no i think agree. it's i think it's definitely a valid point to raise especially if there are people listening who have sort of hated everything we've said and um and that's completely fine if you are someone who is wholeheartedly against culling then you know that's and you've come to that decision having listened to this episode or having looked into culling you know you're obviously completely entitled to your position and your opinion but it is, it is worth asking these kind of tougher questions of, well, is it species specific? Am I, am I always, is it method specific? And am I okay with eating meat or just the kind of general societal treatment towards domestic animals? Am I okay to euthanize my pet but not cull a wild animal? Questions like this that I think do make it almost impossible to have a really black and white view of these kind of issues. Um, and I think I think Emma it is maybe a bit controversial, but it is worth listen. It is worth kind of bringing up when we're talking about, especially issues like culling and trophy hunting that are conservation issues that become animal welfare issues. And if we are obviously acknowledging the animal welfare element, then we need to think, okay, well, where does where do we draw that line of what mm. we are okay with and what we're not okay with? and whether there is a difference between domestic and wild animals. And if you do entirely oppose culling on um, a kind of animal welfare 
stance if that if that if that's the reason that you're entirely opposed to it um the reason perhaps it would be interesting for you to for and this is actually just coming to my head now this is how i justify it to myself as someone who is under case specific scenarios in favor of conservation culling so this is a glimpse into how i justify it the way i justify it is it is not ethical to kill large numbers of a native animal that has no impact on human safety or the economy. Badgers would be the example. And so in this scenario, I'm not actually judging the value of the badger's life, but what the value of the badger's death might bring. Contrastingly, I think it is ethical to cull deer because the huge numbers of deer are A, an artifact of human interference in the environment, and through the removal of natural population controls, and B, these numbers are actively harming more animals and more wildlife than the deer themselves. And so the way I justify it is actually not making a distinction on the worth of the animals' lives, but actually making a distinction on the worth of what each of their deaths might bring. So that's that's yeah. my mindset, why I can sit here and say, hand on my heart, I oppose the badger cull, but I'm not entirely opposed to the deer cull. So that's just I think, a um, little glimpse into my logic. I think that's pretty much what we hope you take from season two of this podcast in a nutshell, is that conservation is all about trade-offs and really hard decisions. Mm. And you don't have to agree with everything we say. There is a lot of debate within the conservation field and that's incredible because that's what spurs progress. Um, but it's that's a really key element of conservation that's quite hard to learn is that you're involved in all these trade-offs mm. um but i think we've covered this this has been quite a heavy <laughs> um and quite a really intense conversation so we hope that it's been interesting and we wanted to actually end with a little bit of good news a good news conservation story to kind of leave you all on a bit of a light-hearted note so <laughs> Roby, do you want to yes. take us away with some good news? So this is elephants again. We've been talking about elephants a lot, but African Ooh. Parks, who are a fantastic conservation organisation who govern a lot of African parks in Africa, um, <laughs> have successfully translocated more than 500 elephants in uh, 2015. So this happened in Malawi. It's a country that's very close to my heart. My mother grew up in Malawi and we visited. It's lovely. I love Malawi. One of my favourite places on earth. So it's very nice to hear that this is happening there. Um, and in total, Liwonde National Park and Maheti Wildlife Reserve had a surplus of elephants. And so there was a risk of them being culling. The population had exceeded carrying capacity. Too many elephants. But... 500 elef 520 elephants in total from both parks were translocated in the largest translocation, single translocation event in Africa, and they repopulated oh. in Kota Kota National Park, uh, which had a complete dearth of elephants. It had fewer than 100 because it had been massively poached. And so given that Malawi is really densely populated, there's this kind of very narrow country with Lake Malawi on one side and Zambia on the other, Congo to the north, southern Africa to the south, um, incredibly densely populated. So uh, wildlife migration corridors, wildlife corridors were not feasible. And so this was termed human assisted migration, which I quite like. Um, and yeah, there was no culling involved. 100, 520 elephants were taken from two areas and moved to another. And it kind of really nicely killed two birds. Oh, I don't want to say that. Killed two birds with one stone. Um, uh, released two birds with one thing um, and, uh, and peter farnhead the ceo of african park said seldom do we hear good news about elephants in africa this successful translocation is a pivotal moment for malawi which has emerged as a leader of african elephant conservation and park restoration so that's good news to end this episode on with the elephants yeah that's fantastic um so that's yeah that's really put me in a good mood to go for the <laughs> yeah it's day. good to end on something positive because that was quite a hard hitting yeah. i think podcast definitely but thank you so much for listening if you've stayed with us this far um and <laughs> to, to kind of catch up and stay up to date with everything we do with the biome project um you can go to the biome website which is www.biome-project.co.uk uh, we are on Instagram, which is at Biome by Grizzly or the Biome podcast on Spotify. 
And if you want to watch this on YouTube, the channel name is Grizzly and the whole Biome project is on there as well. So you can watch all of the previous podcasts as well as other videos that we have made. Um, and if you want to follow us as individuals on Instagram, we are Roby Watkinson Wildlife, Emma Hodson Wildlife and Conservation Kate. And we all post lots of environmental <laughs> and animal content over on there. So you can give that a look if you are interested. And before you go, don't forget, we'd love to hear what you want to think. Comments, thoughts, anything. What are your positions on culling? Is it case specific like most of us or a complete opposition or complete in favour? We want to hear from you. We want to have a conversation. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, just thanks for listening. It might be hard hitting. Maybe go away. Think about some of the stuff that we said. It takes a while to process this. Um, but yeah, we will see you all in the next podcast. Bye. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.